Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Johnson, and I am the executive director of the Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition Movement, an organization that has been working on the ground in communities most affected by gun violence. The Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition Movement conducts high-touch community engagement initiatives designed to change communities, norms including occupying the most dangerous corners, to shift the culture and provide information on resources that could help young people turn their lives around conducting conflict resolution workshops and critical decision-making skills workshops for youth and young adults, facilitating workshops for public safety staff to help them in their community engagement efforts, addressing socioeconomic and quality of life issues. We also work with families to support them if they have been victims of gun violence. We go to the scene of the crime and we work with them beyond that. We also I'm so sorry. It's so emotional for me, and it means a lot, what Thank I'm you, saying, sir. and I'm glad to be here, so I just want to make sure I'm conveying that message perfectly. So gun violence is important to me because in 1999, my son's father was shot in the head when my son was only one years old. He was left not only paralyzed and in a disabled position, but in a coma for two years, and he still has not gotten up from that. Mm. And over the years, I watched how that negatively impacted my son. And I knew that many other children were experiencing similar situations due to gun violence. I have friends and colleagues that had to bury their children because of gun violence. I have seen families ruined by the absence of those killed. And I work with children who are deeply traumatized by so much gun violence in the community. And some of my colleagues and friends who had to bury their children are in this room today. We have to acknowledge that and make strides to save our children and the communities that we love. Governor Murphy's commitment to fighting gun violence in not only my community, but in communities throughout New Jersey, means there will be resources and gun laws that could have a significant impact on the movement to eradicate gun violence. State level support on the public health crisis of gun violence could save the lives of many families and allow those families to live the life they deserve. I can't wait to get the ball rolling and whatever support the Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition can provide, we are all in. As a mother, a community advocate, and the executive director of the Jersey City Anti-Violence Coalition movement, I am proud to introduce Governor Phil Murphy, a man who is committing to providing support and resources to communities affected by gun violence, a governor who understands the importance of enacting laws and, the, and that support and protect every family and every community is needed. Governor Phil Murphy. Thank you. That is a tough act to follow. Good afternoon. Thank you, Pam, for that introduction, for your words, for your life experience, for your efforts to stop gun violence in Jersey City. This is a fight which I am proud to join you, and a fight which Majority Leader Lou Greenwald uh, has led in, in the Assembly for well over a decade. And I, I, I know she would want me to say this. Uh, Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg wanted to be here. Uh, she is tied up. We put this together very quickly. So I, I, th I think it's fair to say that she's with us in spirit uh, today. We all know that this is a critical fight, not just for Jersey City or for any one of our cities, but for every community in New Jersey. As we have seen from the gun data collected so far this year by Attorney General Grabeer Grewal, always an honor to be with you, sir. Every county across our state is being impacted by gun violence. By the way, I now know you by the color of your t-shirts and it's, honored, it's a particular honor to have so many of the advocates here. And I also want to give Bill Castor, our senior advisor on gun safety, a shout out as well. We have unfortunately more reminders of the importance of this fight. Close to home, it is the loss of 17-year-old Jade Saunders of Jersey City, shot and killed in front of her friends just Friday night. We fully support the efforts of law enforcement to find those responsible. And it is also the city of Pittsburgh, which on Saturday experienced the awful scourge of mass gun violence with the senseless slaughter of 11 Jewish congregants at the Tree of Life Synagogue and the wounding of others, including four brave members of law enforcement. That was the worst attack against a Jewish community in the history of the United States of America. Once again, a person with an irrational grudge and who had openly expressed hate 
was able to take advantage of Congress's stubbornness to close the all-too-easy pipeline to guns to rain terror on a community. And for all of these, we were discussing this a short while ago, for all these big, awful events, like the slaughter on Saturday, there's a daily drumbeat of gun violence that we can never ignore. And Pam lives that every day and tries to stop it in Jersey City, but up and down the state. There are both, unfortunately and sadly, the big events and the daily drumbeat events. Specific to Saturday, anti-Semitism is nothing new to us here in New Jersey. We have seen too much of it of late. The Anti-Defamation League has shown us that anti-Semitic activity is on the rise. I think 2017 compared to 2016 up over 30 percent in one year alone. However, we have been lucky that the peddlers of anti-Semitism here in New Jersey, at least so far, have armed themselves only with cans of sp spray paint and words of hate and not guns. We can and must battle anti-Semitism through education and direct community to community outreach. This will not be an easy task. It will require our constant commitment, but we must take this task head on. We will not allow hate to be normalized, period. And we must ensure that those intent on acting on their hate through violence do not have access to guns. Gun violence is also not a problem we can eliminate through the passage of a single magic law, I sure wish it was, it requires our constant attention. These are our reminders that no matter how strong we think our gun laws are, we must always look to close loopholes that escaped our prior efforts and to enact new regulations when a horrific incident exposes weaknesses. We cannot let President Trump and the NRA distract us from the fact and logic with their nonsense that, no, that more guns is the answer. Time and again, they are proven wrong. We cannot wait for Congress to come to its senses and pass common sense gun safety laws. We must act, and we must act now. Today, with, Assembly, uh, with Assemblyman and Majority Leader Greenwald here, and with Majority Leader Weinberg here in spirit, I'm pleased to announce our second effort this year to do just that through a comprehensive package of legislation, Gun Safety Package 2.0. These latest bills will focus on gun trafficking, tightening the regulation of ammunition, speeding the accessibility of smart gun technology, and expanding community-based violence intervention. We will begin by closing existing loopholes that could keep someone trafficking in firearms from facing prosecution. We must criminalize all aspects of gun trafficking, period. We cannot allow any daylight that would allow someone who does not have a legal right to possess a firearm from either receiving or selling a gun. In addition, we will seek to add a conviction for illegal firearms possession to the list of crimes that would disqualify a person from being able to purchase a gun. This is just common sense. Our effort will also seek to more closely regulate the sale of ammunition which, by the way, I, I'm going to be charitable, the, the current regulations are, shall we say, antiquated. We would require photo identification. Okay, that's not a big deal, right? To be shown prior to any sale of ammunition. We would bar individuals disqualified from owning a gun from purchasing or owning ammunition, closing that loophole. And we would require all sales of handgun ammunition to be reported to the state police. On smart gun technology, we will update our law to help speed the development and marketability of such firearms. Currently, state law requires firearms dealers to sell only smart guns once the Attorney General determines the technology is viable and, av and available. Again, to only at that point sell smart guns. Unfortunately, this law has led to threatened boycotts of any manufacturer working on smart technology, and it has had the unintended consequence of stymieing the development of smart technology. So as part of this reform, we will narrow the smart gun requirement so that firearms dealers must offer at least one smart gun for sale when the technology is widely available. We believe this is a logical step to ensure further research and development, and we will also, let me put this uh, colloquially, we will call the bluff of the gun manufacturers. Finally, we would establish a new grant program to help targeted cities implement coordinated, evidence-based violence intervention strategies, bringing together private resources, 
available federal funds and state appropriations to reach a total goal of $15 million, $15 million. After Parkland, we committed to making New Jersey a national leader in the fight against senseless gun violence. And because of the efforts of Majority Leader Greenwald and Majority Leader Weinberg, like-minded and brave legislators and countless advocates, we are. I had an exchange this morning with one of my heroes, Fred Guttenberg, whose daughter uh, was killed in Parkland, and uh, he is with us also in spirit. Now I am even more committed that we do not lose this position of leadership. I am ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work with both leaders and their colleagues to get these measures passed and on my desk so I can sign them into law. I'm ready to work with communities across the state with all the advocates to stop gun violence. I know that Bill Kastner, our administration's leading voice on tackling gun violence, as well as the many advocates in this room and across the state are eager to join us. I also thank our Chief Counsel Matt Platkin, Associate Counsel Justin Dews, and Jeremy Feigenbaum, Counsel to the Attorney General, uh, for their efforts in crafting these latest reforms. We owe nothing less to the people of New Jersey and to the memories of those already lost. It is now my pleasure, actually we're going to the Attorney General next, according to this script, and then we'll, uh, you'll back clean up, Lou, if that's all right. It is now my uh, honor to introduce the Attorney General of the State of New Jersey, Gerbeer Greenwald. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Saturday's acts of senseless hate shook us to our core. We stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters and with every other community that has suffered from gun violence. Unfortunately, this wasn't the first time our nation has suffered such loss, nor is New Jersey a stranger to such violence. Gun violence isn't limited to places like Pittsburgh or Parkland. It unfortunately, as we've heard earlier, affects all of our communities each and every day. So as New Jersey's chief law enforcement officer, I've made addressing gun violence one of my top priorities. Now, tackling gun violence means tackling gun trafficking. So since becoming Attorney General, I've taken concrete steps to, to combat gun trafficking. My office has issued a first-of-its-kind directive requiring state and local law enforcement to share information about every crime gun recovered in the state to help identify traffickers as well as bad faith dealers. We've publicly released information about those crime guns as well to shine a light on those states where it's simply too easy to purchase a firearm. We've worked with the States for Gun Safety Coalition to explore sharing this information across our borders. And earlier this year, we used our law enforcement tools to break up a major trafficking ring that brought guns from Ohio into Camden. But the work we do is only as good as the tools we have. And that's why I'm proud to support Governor Murphy's and the legislature's efforts to strengthen our anti-trafficking laws. New Jersey already has tough rules in place to make sure people who shouldn't have guns can't buy them. But the laws aren't perfect. That's why the governor is calling for, our, for a law that will criminalize owning a gun if you've been convicted of unlawful gun possession in the past. Because if you broke our gun laws before, you can't be trusted with a gun now. And law enforcement needs the tools to prevent criminals from breaking our gun laws again and again. So I'll proudly support other common, law, common sense ways to tighten up our rules on when someone can buy a gun. But all too often, we've seen that people who can't buy guns, like convicted felons, they try to find ways around these rules. They ask someone else to buy that gun for, for them. Someone that we call in law enforcement a straw purchaser. So Governor Murphy is working with the legislature to fight straw purchasing, to punish anyone who uses or even asks these intermediaries to buy these guns for them. And these laws will allow us to target those intermediaries as well. Law enforcement should, law enforcement should have a tool like that to fight this practice head on, and right now we don't. So I want to thank the governor and the legislature for leading on these important proposals. Thank you. Thank you. The fact that uh, Lou and I are together talking about gun safety is not a new phenomenon. Uh, it, in fact, I believe it was the day before Parkland, we were at a, a panel open discussion 
uh, on February 13th, uh, so that was a couple of weeks after I took office. We talked a lot about it when I was running and in transition. Um, he and uh, Senator Weinberg spearheaded the six bills that uh, I signed into law on, I think, June 23rd. So it's an honor to have him back with us today, Majority Leader Lou Greenwald. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. I was in the back uh, for a few moments alone with Pam, and I expressed my disappointment that in spite of the success we, that we've had here in New Jersey, which we should all be so proud of, and to the advocates who are in this room have helped make that possible, that we continue to have to come back. Um, you know, most politicians love the opportunity to stand in front of a camera and feel these bright lights. I, I wish that we could get to a point where we were talking about something, anything else, other than this tragedy. You know, I come here with a heavy heart uh, that we have to continue to come back to address this issue and to go further. But it gives, it, it's, it emboldens me and strengthens me, though, when I have an opportunity to see people like Pam and so many of you who have not lost faith in this process. And I would say to you that the work that my friend the governor and the attorney general today talk about, it should not be lost that we continue to move forward on gun violence prevention laws and regulations that protect the Second Amendment and that do not intrude into that right. And as much as we continue to walk that line to continue to bring consensus to this issue, it frustrates me when people of the greatest power like our president stand up and say that this tragedy in Pittsburgh would not have happened if they would have had an armed guard at that doorway. Never should anyone who is looking to foster their First Amendment right need to have the Second Amendment right there to protect them from their desire to pursue their faith and to pray. We continue in this effort in spite of the fact that in some respects I think we feel like we go about this alone. I want to share a couple of statistics with you and all the great work that so many people are doing. We have a voting session going on right now and the Senate is in caucus. Otherwise this room would be filled with our legislators and I'm very humbled to be here representing people from both parties on this issue. Every day, 96 Americans are killed with guns. Every day. And hundred, hundreds more are shot and injured. Each year, New Jersey alone suffers more than 1,000 interpersonal shootings and almost 300 gun-related homicides and more than 750 non-fatal shootings every year. What makes it worse, and I think what some of the challenges are in the efforts that we try to do is that as stark as those numbers are, in a state of 567 towns, only five cities in our state make up more than half of those shootings. Newark, Camden, Patterson, Trenton, and as a young girl this weekend learned, Jersey City. The violence imposes enormous trauma, lifelong health impairments, and significant economic costs to communities and to our state. The community-based violence intervention programs have been extremely successful in other states, and we look to model them here in New Jersey to reduce gun violence. When these programs are properly utilized, they can produce impressive life-saving and cost-saving results. In Massachusetts, these practices have helped to cut the rate of gun homicide among African-American residents in half over the span of six years. Hospital-based violence intervention programs have worked to break the cycle of violence by providing services to patients recovering from gunshot wounds, such as intensive counseling, case management, and social services. So my office has been working with the governor's office, and we are going to roll out a platform of bills that the governor alluded to, and I just want to give you some specifics. We're looking to introduce legislation that will break down the barriers between gun violence prevention in these five cities primarily and the, and the weight of the impact that these communities face. These bills would do a few things. They would require the victims of the Crime Compensation Office to partner with state-designated trauma centers for referral of trauma patients. They would establish a hospital-based violence intervention program initiative so those recovering from these violent injuries can receive counseling by trained intervention specialists and connections to community services with follow-up assistance. Hospital-affiliated counseling services would be able to directly bill the Violent Crime Compensation Office for counseling services provided to the gunshot and stabbing victims because they are without the resources on their own and yet at a time when they were so desperately needed. It would require our Office of Medicaid to cover professional counseling services for those who have incurred a gunshot wound. 
Level one and two trauma centers in the state would be required to provide hospital-based or hospital-linked violence intervention programs. And finally, allocating funding for community-based violence intervention programs on a competitive basis for cities, health agencies, and nonprofit organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the numbers and we look at the statistics, those five cities tell us a very interesting story. We also know that our largest employers in our state are hospitals and health care providers. And for many of us, our hospital has become a sanctuary of our community for safety and for a last line of defense when it comes to access to health care and in tragic cases like this to protect them from the violence that exists on their streets. By partnering with these groups, by doing this in a joint effort with our governor and our general and the legislature, we believe that once again, we will take another step forward in this fight to keep our streets safe and do so in a way that shows respect to all citizens with a thoughtful approach other than just stationing an armed guard at our places of worship and our churches and synagogues. Thank you for being here with us once again. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for showing up, particularly our friends in the, in the rainbow colors. Please, a couple of questions. Governor, this is not the first time you've addressed this. We've made a lot of efforts. Does it get exhausting to you, um, sad? Do you feel hopeless sometimes? Can you talk about the struggle because this is not a new problem? Yeah, um, angry, I think, uh, and, and frustrated as heck. You know, we continue, and maybe Grabeer could address this, but a, a reality is close, plus or minus 80 percent of the guns involved in gun crimes in New Jersey. 82 percent. 82 percent are guns that are still coming in from out of state. And as you know, we've got, we've, as of now, I guess going on six months, we're naming and shaming. Uh, the trafficking piece of this is a, big, uh, is a big step in that direction. So I'm never hopeless. I'm never hopeless. And, and listen, smart gun technology, I had an extraordinary, it was in a town hall now several years ago, I met a mom whose son was killed. Now, admittedly, this happened before this technology was even a dream, uh, by uh, another young man uh, in Newark who had taken his dad's service revolver, was a law enforcement officer, and killed her son. That wouldn't have happened if, this, if smart gun technology was in place and that service revolver would only discharge with the biometrics of um, of, of, the, of the dad who was the police officer. So I'm, I'm, I'm with, Lou said this, so I think he said it well, I can't believe we're coming back, you know, we're gonna, we're constantly coming back, but that doesn't mean we're hopeless, that doesn't mean we're any less resolved. Um, it means we're gonna do everything literally within our power, including keeping the pressure on in Congress. You know, the election, I'm not, I don't wanna get political, but there are elections in eight days, and then I wanna be back on the folks who are prepared to change the reality in Washington, so we can't give up on that either. Thank you, please. Yeah. These are new bills that are being introduced, or they... Lou, you may want to talk. There's a whole this this encompasses probably eight or ten bills, right? Yeah. So historically, so the hospital-based violence prevention bills are a new package of bills that have come again, and it continues to do what we've always said to show respect to all parties by walking the line. The smart gun technology legislation is legislation that we've done in the past. Uh, that we've modernized. Unfortunately, we did not have the support from the last administration. And to piggy bank on the governor's comments, you know, elections do matter. Yep. So uh, the progress that we were able to make on the last package, uh, 1.0, uh, to fund the governor, was really has been around for a number of years, but it was only successful because this governor was willing to sign it. And he has reached out to us in a proactive way on the second package of 2.0. I want to I ask the general to come back up just to piggyback on the question of trafficking and how this the steps involved there can address this crazy 82 percent that's coming in from out of state. Sure. There's, there's two pieces to that. I alluded to it in my remarks. Uh, one of the initiatives that we put into place was the sharing of information mandating for the first time that our local uh, law enforcement agencies participate in this information sharing platform, which allows us to get information from the ATF as to the point of purchase, the first purchaser, which is critically important information in targeting bad out-of-state actors, gun shops where it's simply too easy to buy guns and where straw purchasers are going to buy guns that are finding their way into New Jersey and being used uh, in criminal activity. And, and then the, the first piece of legislation that we talked about uh, on the uh, straw purchaser bill, uh, we don't have currently an ability to charge somebody for a violation of state law as a straw purchaser. 
It shouldn't be the case that we have to find other laws in which to fit that conduct. We need to address that conduct head on. And, and so it, to have a, a bill and, and a law that we would be happy to work with the, the legislature on that addresses this conduct will just give us another tool to identify bad actors who are, are being used to purchase firearms illegally. Michael. Governor, is it fair to say that this is a response to Pittsburgh? This, this press conference wasn't planned prior to Saturday, correct? Yeah, yes and no, Michael. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, Lou and I go way back on this. The general and I go way back. Pam and I are meeting uh, uh, today, but she is a, a sister in arms on this uh, and has done extraordinary work in, in Jersey City. Um, we were in discussions and we are constantly in discussions on how to strengthen our gun safety laws. At one level, yes, Pittsburgh uh, made us get here today. So the answer has to be yes. But, and I repeat something I, I said earlier, um, this, is a, this is one of these realities where Pittsburgh is on the front page, the awfulness of Pittsburgh is on the front page as it should be, but there is the daily drumbeat. Uh, that we deal with in this state, in particular in the five communities that Lou referred to, uh, that would have brought us here at some point in any event. I have one more question, but it's off topic. Right. We'll, we'll stay on for a minute, is that right, Elise? Yeah, I said this in, in, from the, in the sanctuary of a synagogue uh, on uh, Sunday morning. Uh, the answer is we have, to, we have to look at that real hard with the legislature. Uh, the, dis the disparity uh, it feels imbalanced uh, by, any, by any metric. Relatedly, if I may at least without, but staying in the same, I wonder if, if the general could come back up. I think we probably in this, in this same uh, uh, arena maybe spend 30 seconds on what, in fact, we are doing uh, since Saturday in particular, although there's a fair amount of this that we're doing every day in any event, but I would sure. love you to address some of that if you could. Sure. This is something we've been doing uh, all year, and it's being done uh, by our Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness under the direction of uh, Director Jared Maples. Uh, we provide uh, analyses for houses of worship uh, on how they could better harden themselves against threats, external threats, particularly um, acts of terror and things of that nature. And we help facilitate uh, grant funding through uh, money available through the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Uh, and that's something that's been going on for a number of years, and that's something that uh, we had a call with faith leaders across the state this morning uh, with, with the Colonel of the State Police, with the director, reminding uh, religious leaders of these services and, and of this grant funding that's available to them to help uh, harden houses of worship. Uh, and we also brought to their attention uh, the need to report incidents, big and small, uh, so we could identify what might seem as sort of, you know, a small incident uh, and might not fit into something, um, you know, that, that rises to the level of an immediate threat but might fit into something else that we're looking at. And so we have uh, a, a bias crimes hotline at the Attorney General's office, uh, which we, we can share publicly. It's on our website. Uh, and again, OHSP has great resources as well. That, that assessment uh, capability that we provide is free of charge, yep. uh, uh, importantly. Uh, and so we want to make sure folks know are, are aware of that. Please. It's a good question. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I hope a big effect in the right direction. I was just back and forth. With, I mentioned Fred Gutenberg. I was back and forth with Mark Kelly uh, a short while ago. I know he's out there tirelessly working, and uh, Kevin Quinn, who chairs the Brady campaign, and I were back uh, and forth. I hope it has a big impact. Uh, this awfulness, I hope, has a silver lining to it. And by the way, if you haven't, I'm sure you all have, Read the ages in the, in the life stories of the people who were killed on Saturday. And the one that just jumps out at me is, can you imagine a 97-year-old woman getting up on the Sabbath, getting ready to go to pray, and her life ending uh, as she's murdered inside of a house of worship? It's extraordinary. Anyone else other than that? Please. I'll have a question. Hold on. I, I, I owe my, Michael first. Just as a follow-up to Elise's question, Governor, has there been any um, increase in hearings? 
security at Jewish synagogues or Yes, I, I should, and, and Gerber ought to come back in here. I was going to say this after he commented. If, this, if, the Colonel, if Colonel Callahan were here, we have meaningfully deepened and hardened patrols and presence. Is that fair to say? That's a fair statement. That's what the state police and, and local law enforcement as well have stepped up patrols of houses of worship in light of what happened on Saturday. Sure. Uh, much of this is reported already. Uh, we're just going to, I mean, I, it remains to see, you know, be seen what the legislation looks at, like. But what we want to do is update it. Uh, it shouldn't be handwritten reports. It should be searchable reports that law enforcement can use to further investigations. The notion that in this day and age we're doing paper records and submitting paper records to the state police about this type of information that's just shocking. Uh, we're in, in an information age where information flows quickly, and we should be able to search that information quickly to further law enforcement investigations. That's the thing that jumped out at me, and is that it's it's paper based. So we got to get into the uh, comfortably into the 21st century. Is this on or off? Uh, please. Um, do you have a timeline on how quickly you think this is done? Lou, how quickly do you think you can move? Uh, we're going to move very quickly. Uh, I would say definitely as we go through the holidays and the, into the beginning of next year, the, much of the legislation has already been drafted and it's being done in a joint effort with the governor's office and the attorney general's office. So uh, our goal will be to get it in a final form so that we're not passing it and then doing amendments after. So our goal is to move, I would say, I know it sounds like a long time, but I would hope within three months that we should be able to, to move this. Well, do you, do you have any bill schedules? I don't, no. Okay. Too, too early to tell. Um, yeah, I would say uh, this is a good example of pe we're, we're, we're working seamlessly together to get this done to, uh, jointly and as fast as possible. C a couple, Michael, and then we'll... Uh, uh, there was a rally in Newark this weekend organized by the Institute for Social Justice. Yes. It was a 94 percent. Apparently you got 94 percent of the African Americans I did. Uh, and they want... I'm proud of that. that. Now, and you signed one of their demands Yes. Two more outstanding are to restore the right to vote to people with criminal convictions and to work toward closing the racial wealth gap by prioritizing wealth generation and home ownership in black communities. Can you speak to what, whether these two things would get done? Yes. Yeah, so so um, I was not at the rally. I was, I was uh, unable to be there. Uh, I certainly support the fact it took place. I'm incredibly proud of the support I, I have had uh, and continue to have out of the African-American community. And we, we have long memories. So the fact that I won with that percentage uh, doesn't mean that I just sort of slapped my hands together and, and forgot. Um, so we've, you know, right early on in the first number of days, we reconstituted the Criminal Justice Sentencing Commission that had laid dormant in the past eight years. Uh, if you look at our master economic plan, there's a huge amount of uh, shrinkage in our objectives, shrinkage of poverty, shrinkage of inequities across race and gender as it relates to job growth and wage growth. Uh, th th those are intended explicitly to get at wealth creation. Um, I've spoken openly about furthering opening, further opening up of our democracy, including uh, uh, the inclusion of ex-offenders. So those are all things that we've been on record, in, in many cases working with the legislature on, uh, and I would hope that we get there sooner than later. Wealth creation takes time. So that's the one thing that I would say that that is a, we're digging out of uh, centuries of inequities in this country. Um, it will take time to shrink that, but the fastest way to shrink it is to, is to shrink poverty, shrink the gaps across gender and race as it relates to job growth and wage growth. One more, maybe. Go, Sorry, I'm come, come on. To, I'm going to go back okay. to the voting session. Good luck. Thank you for Take having care. me, General. See, thank you. See you. Thank you. So Thanks, Lou. Please. I don't know, actually. It, it, <laughs> the guy walking out the door would have a better handle on that than I, uh, than I would have. I, I, I actually don't know. I still want it to be sooner than later. I'm ready to go. You know, there are a few things I think it's pretty clear that we've said before that we're ready to go on. I'm ready to go on minimum wage. I'm ready to go on adult use marijuana, furthering opening the medical marijuana regime. Uh, I'm ready to go on further steps to open up democracy. Um, 
So the pen is in my hand. I'm ready to rock. It's, it's, timing is important, particularly on adult use marijuana, but it's important that we do it right, and I also would say that. What we'll do, real two quickies, please. I don't have the excuse anymore of saying we have to stop because Lou has to get back to the, his, his session. I'll let the legislature speak for themselves. I respect the processes that we've put in place. We've got a three-prong uh, parallel process in place. One is to figure out what the heck happened, and that is being independently done by a very distinguished uh, former Supreme Court Justice, former Chief Counsel, former Chief of Staff. Uh, secondly, Mamta Patel is looking at government policies and figuring out, wait a minute, are we in the 21st century sufficiently? And not just in the 21st century, I want to make sure on these sorts of things we lead the nation. And the general is overseeing a holistic, how do we get the best society for survivors uh, of anywhere uh, in, in this country? Uh, where, where you look at this woman's story and it makes you sick, uh, just the lack of the structure in our society, the lack of respect for su survivors. So my goals are that, figure out what happened. Let's get our government policies the very best they can be. Let's make New Jersey broadly, under this uh, august leadership, a society that people look up to and says they respect survivors unlike anybody else. Let's keep politics out of this. Let's make sure we look at all of government, not just some of government. And, I, I'm, and I'm beyond that, I'm, I'm uh, expecting and hoping for, for good results. Somebody else have one? I apologize, yes. I, I don't have a sense of when per se, but this isn't. This shouldn't be that hard. Some of these things are really hard. When you're creating an industry, as the the adult use marijuana uh, step would take, that's quite complicated. And by the way, when you're adding to that the medical piece and the look back provisions, which must be a part of this, because I'm only signed on to this because of social justice. In another example of shrinking inequities, that's the biggest reason I should add to, add to my list. That's the number one and frankly only reason I care about doing this, because the white non-white gap of persons incarcerated in our state is the biggest in America, and most of it's due to low-end drug crime. Uh, and so we got to get there. I'm confident we will. I can't tell you exactly when, but that is complicated. Minimum wage should get to $15 in a responsible time frame, uh, and I don't think it's that hard, frankly. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working with the legislative leaders to get that done. Um, I think we got to go. I want to thank, uh, in particular, the advocates. Pam, I want to thank you for your courage and for others who have had to live with gun violence so personally. General, always an honor. Thank you all very much. Thank you.